Hey, what's up, everybody? Pastor Matt here. Thanks for checking into my YouTube channel. Thought I would go live unexpectedly on this, what is it, Tuesday afternoon. Uh, a little bit of a boring afternoon. I did go into the office today, but nobody was there. Uh, another quiet, very boring day. Well, one person was there, actually, but it's been boring for the most part. Um, so welcome to this unexpectedly live chat video in which I am going to talk about my exhaustive Bible study system video, which I did a couple of days ago. That video got a ton of traffic and views, which relative to this channel uh, is a different number than, for instance, if it was like Dude Perfect or something. A, a good number for Dude Perfect would be like 20 million views, but a good number for my channel is 5,000 views, 7,000. I think it's maybe at 8,000 views, which suggest that um, people liked that video and had a ton of questions about it. So I thought I would just randomly go live this afternoon and maybe try to answer as many of those questions as I possibly can before dinner is ready. So that's my that's my challenge tonight. I see I have 13 people out there watching. Um, a couple of you are chatting already. Hey, would you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Sometimes I worry about the audio using a different computer today. So give me a thumbs up, somebody out there, uh, or comment on the live chat if you can hear the audio. I'm assuming you can. I'm just going to go ahead like you can hear me. Uh, so let's see. Okay, good. Beard is looking good. Excellent. Yes, this is CoBeard19. Um, every beard I grow has a code name, and this one is <laughs> CoBeard19 because I'm not going to trim it until the magistrate gives us permission to live our normal lives again. So we'll just see what this thing does in time. So, uh, hey, thanks for checking in. Lots more of you on there now. Very cool. What's up, everybody? Okay, let's get into it. So a couple of days ago, I'm not sure how many days ago it's been now, I did a video called My Exhaustive Bible Study System in which I tried to pull together a bunch of my other videos. Really nothing was new on that video, if I'm completely honest. Everything I said in that 15 minutes had been said at different times and in different places, but what I tried to do is put it all together this time so that you could see all of the things that I use in one place and I could kind of explain the whole Bible study system. So that video did fairly well in terms of uh, viewer content, questions, comments, of course, the occasional wacko, wingnuts, weirdo uh, chimed in and said crazy things in the comments, but most of it was fairly constructive and a lot of really good questions came out of it. So I originally started to go through the questions and try to answer as many of them as I possibly could, but I thought, hey, you know what? If you like this kind of content, let me just print up a bunch of the questions and I'll go through them one by one and answer as many as we can. So let's start off. Here we go. This is from Gretchen T. She says, I need a tutorial though on what to write. That's where I generally get tripped up, especially not being a studied theologian, but just an avid student of the Bible with a few theology classes in my experience. Well, thanks Gretchen for that great comment. No, you don't need to be a professional theologian. You don't need to be a pastor. You don't need to be a Bible teacher. You don't need to do anything vocationally or professionally to have an excellent Bible study system. In fact, it seems to me that any Bible-believing Christian who loves God and loves his word would want to know his word as thoroughly as you possibly could know it. And so for me, that implies a few things. First of all, that you're reading it all the time. And secondly, that you're reading it with some sort of interactivity in which you're praying back to God the things that you read in Scripture. And also you're trying to learn in some sort of a some sort of a formatted way what Scripture contains. Of course, if you're familiar with this channel, you know that I have an extremely high view of Scripture, that I believe Scripture is inspired infallible and inerrant and it is literally the vox day or the voice of god when we read scripture it's nothing less than if god were speaking to us out loud so authoritative is his word so we do well to try to begin to assimilate as much of scriptural revelation into our minds and hearts as possible and for me and apparently for a lot of you out there that also involves some court some sort of interactive bible note-taking, underlining, highlighting, margin writing, etc. So I became a, um, a convinced wide-marginer 
couple of years ago now. It's been several years actually that I've been into wide margining. And for me, I think it's simply the best way to learn God's word is to constantly interact with it with pen and paper. And so Gretchen's question really pertains to what sort of notes should you be taking in your wide margin? Or in the case of uh, my recommendation, having a blank Bible or a miscellaneous system, I do all three wide margin, blank Bible, and miscellaneous system. And that's what I, that's what I described in uh, the exhaustive Bible study video. But there's a ton of different things that you should be taking notes about. So let's start with the obvious, which is the text itself. Whenever you're reading a particular passage, you should be noting, commenting, highlighting on the text itself. And what are you looking for? Well, you're looking for all the kinds of things that you look for when you read anything, but especially scripture. You're looking for imagery. You're looking for metaphors. You're looking for context between local, regional, and uh, expanded uh, context, those connections between those things. Um, you're looking at verb tense. You're looking on adjectives. You're looking at pronouns. You're making all sorts of observations about the passage itself. Um, does this passage include any literary devices? If so, what are they? Uh, is this passage foreshadowed by, or does this passage foreshadow another passage that is subsequent to it? So all those things we might simply put under the category of literary analysis. We're analyzing what the text itself says. We're looking for key words. Um, can I define them? What is the definition of justification or sanctification or regeneration? Those would all be what I would call textual notes that you can put in your margin. Okay, besides that, um, even if you're not a theologian or a pastor, I would suggest that you put in the outlines for the sermons that you that you hear. You know, your pastor goes to great lengths to put together, if he's a faithful pastor, Bible studies and sermons. And most of those, I would hope, are not just his ad hoc random thoughts that fly out of his mouth, but some sort of a studied attempt to put together a coherent message. And so taking notes on your pastor's sermons uh, is an excellent thing to do or your Bible study. So there's that. Um, you could also put in your margins uh, stories or illustrations, especially if you are a pastor or a teacher, you might want to keep a catalog of stories or illustrations so you can put those in, in your margins. Um, you especially want to make notes on how Scripture connects with itself, uh, New Testament and Old Testament connections. You're making your own system of cross-references. Most Bibles have a pretty good cross-reference system in them. Uh, some don't. Most do. Uh, but if not, you might want to begin making your own cross-references as Scripture connects with Scripture. Um, extended quotations. Um, you might want to have a place where you can write quotations into your wide margin. Um, references to other works. So, for instance, uh, you know, Calvin's Institutes, Book 3, Chapter 4, you know, that kind of a note. Basically, my suggestion is you put in any notes that is going to be helpful to you later on at some point in your walk, whether it's a story, illustration, a prayer request. I even write my own prayers into the margins of my Bible. So for me, it's pretty much anything goes. The only rule I have as to what I would not write in my Bible is something that's going to waste space and be irrelevant for me later. So if I think that a particular thought is not going to be helpful to me later on, then I'm probably not going to waste that space in the margin because margin space is way too precious for me to waste. All right. Michael H., why do you prefer written versus digital notebooks? Well, yeah, uh, I do, but not exclusively. I do prefer written resources, but not exclusively. And I'll, I'll share a little bit about that. There's a couple of reasons that I prefer written resources, though. One of them is simply, um, I, I get tired of the screen. You know, a lot of my work as a pastor and as a writer takes place in front of a screen. And part of my brain just wants to get away from that. I do have a concern that our day and age, we are addicted to our screens. And so part of me just like, I put it away, get it out of my mind. I don't wanna wake up to it. I don't wanna go to bed to it. Um, although I do a lot of nights, uh, in mornings, wake up to the screens, using screens all day. I just want to put them away. I want to get out my pens, my paper, my notebooks, and my Bibles, and just have some good study time completely separated from devices. But there's more than that, too. 
part of it has to do with learning style. You know, our brains work in a three-dimensional way, or what we might call they have a spatial dimension, dimensionality to them. And here's what I mean by that. When you physically write something out in your hand in a particular place in your Bible, you have far more likelihood that you're going to remember that note or idea than if it's just somewhere on the screen of a tablet or a phone. There's something to physically writing things out with our hands, touching them, holding them, a three-dimensional object like a book or a Bible in our hand. The brain has a weird way of processing data and... I tend to be a very visual learner, and so if I write something in a book or if I highlight a book, even if it's not the Bible, it's just any old book, I tend to remember where that is in the book. I can think left page, right page, top, uh, middle, bottom. I just tend to see things visually in my spatial memory, and so for me, having a tangible object is far better than, than a screen. And then probably the third reason why I prefer um, – physical objects, pens, paper, and Bibles to screens is because I do want to hand off something to um, to my family at some point. I love to collect family heirlooms. I value them and treasure them, and I can imagine myself passing down my collection of Bibles and notebooks to my own heirs. And I doubt whatever digital media looks like 50 years from now, however we store it or, or categorize it, um, I, I don't think anyone's going to want to look through it, <laughs> to be completely honest. Uh, so so that's that. Now, I will say, though, Michael, that I'm not completely against digital resources. In fact, there are a few things that I do use digital resources for. One of them that I've never mentioned yet is my notes on theology. Um, you say, well, what's the difference between that and, and the miscellaneous? Well, my miscellaneous notebooks are just that. They're miscellaneous thoughts, ideas that come to me and kind of a boom, idea sort of a way. But I started taking notes on systematic theology several years ago. This probably doesn't surprise you if you know how organized my brain tends to be. Um, When I was teaching a doctrine class for our elders and uh, we had a short book, I think it was What is Reformed Theology by R.C. Sproul. I took notes on the whole book. And then the next year we taught a different class. We taught what is, no, uh, Salvation Belongs to the Lord by John Frame. And I integrated those two books notes into one set of theology notes and boom, here, here grows another one of my notebooks. And so for the last five, six, seven years, I've been adding, 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 adding notes in an order that is faithful to most systematic theology. So basically keeping the categories right, theology proper, Christology, soteriology, eschatology, ecclesiology, all the ologies, I've got them all in the right categories and in order. And whenever I come across a cool quote, thought, um, illustration, whatever, I just simply plug that in. That is the book that, by the way, is available on Amazon called Love God With All Your Mind, one of my, one of my works. Uh, Although I don't necessarily recommend it because it's great for teaching classes with, but it's not a good read. So please don't hop on Amazon and buy that book. I only would have you get it if you were in one of my uh, Wednesday night or Sunday school classes or something like that. So don't don't think that's anything genius, but it is my orderly digital notes on theology. Uh, Live Luke has two questions. What are the two best commentaries and what is better, the Cambridge or the Crossway Wide Margin? Well, I'm not sure I would limit myself to two commentaries. Um, Gosh, why would I have two commentaries? If I just had to pick, maybe Matthew Henry. I know he's old school, way old school. I know he's, you know, on every website online, but he still is excellent. Um, Gosh, I'd almost want to say MacArthur because his commentary is pretty good, although I'm not dispensational. So I'm going to disagree with him on a lot of things related to the end times and the church and the relationship of the church and Israel. But overall, a very good commentary, very helpful. But instead of just picking two commentaries, I would say begin collecting the best commentary from each book of the Bible and do that. Get them as you need them. Don't go out and buy the whole set of word biblical commentary. Um, 
get the best commentary on each book of the Bible one by one as you're teaching or reading through them. And if you need help and you're not sure where to get the best commentaries, there's actually a website called bestcommentaries.com, which has them rated by users over time. And so you can kind of read through and see what the best commentary is on any book of the Bible. And the cream does tend to rise to the top on that website. So I would I would recommend it. Second question was between the Cambridge or the Crossway wide margin. Well, you know, um, it's kind of like asking me if I want to eat or drink. Um, I like I like both. I like food and I like water. Um, they're both good. It's kind of like asking me if I if I want to um, <laughs> I don't know have I like them both. That's what I'm trying to say. The Cambridge is an excellent Bible. I used it for years and years. The font is small. That's its weakness. The Crossway Heirloom Wide Margin is an excellent Bible. Its Achilles heel is the paper is not as good. So you're really choosing between two things. Do you want a bigger font and worse paper? If so, get the Crossway uh, Heirloom Wide Margin. If you want smaller font and better paper, then get the Cambridge Wide Margin, but you can't have both and that's the bottom line. Uh, M. Goodman, why Google Keep versus Google versus uh, Evernote? Okay, two good note keeping systems, but I use Google Keep because it integrates fully with all of the other Google pro products that I use regularly. So Evernote is kind of on its own; it's its own it's its own thing. I've used it very experimentally, but I don't know much about it. Somebody will probably correct me and tell me I'm way off. But I tend to like to integrate my softwares together so that they all work seamlessly. So I use Google Docs, I use Google Slides, I use Gmail, I use Google Keep, I use Google Duo, I use Google Drive, and all of it just integrates so seamlessly I have no problems with it. So I, I like Google Keep. One thing that's cool about it, you can make all sorts of notebooks in it if you wanna make all various different files. And if you take a picture of text, then it can read that text and seamlessly turn it into a document. So no problem with that. I could take a picture of a page of the phone book and it would convert it instantly into text. So there's advantages to using uh, Google that way. Now, Google also, hey, you're the product with Google. So man, um, there's a good documentary on Netflix about how Google takes your information from you. So be careful of that. Tony asks, one note and a tablet? Uh, no, I don't use either one of those. I don't use OneNote and I don't use a tablet. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those things. It's just my own personal um, disposition, I suppose. The reason I don't use a tablet is because, and I know this is really geeky, but the best class I ever took in high school, the most relevant class to my future career, <laughs> career as a pastor and a writer was typing. All right. Um, so I am a I'm not good. I don't mean to brag. I'm a crazy good typer. I'm really good. Uh, I'm a I'm a professional writer for goodness sakes. I I type. I'm typing and writing constantly, either in sermon preparation or my books or research or Edward studies or whatever it is I'm doing. I happen to be a good typer, so I would not use a tablet because that's not conducive to good typing. So I use my Google Chromebook, or I use my desktop computer at work. Bill says, do you use the scripture journals when you go to the actual study? Okay, so that's a reference to my previous video I already mentioned. Yes, I do, Bill. The ESV scripture journals that you're talking about, I, I physically bring them with me to the study, and I use them to lead the Bible study. Um, they're great. They have a ton of blank space on them. They're very small. They're very lightweight, super easy to use. Very, very user friendly. You could just buy one. You could just buy Galatians or Deuteronomy or Ecclesiastes, or you can buy the whole kit and caboodle, get the old and new testament sets, but they're fantastic. Yes, I do bring them, and yes, I also do bring my Bible with me too. Raymond says, How good is the paper in the ESV blank Bible, the interleaved one? Okay, I've got it right here in front of me. And I'll say this when it comes to judging paper quality, okay, there's a thing called GSM, and that's the grams per square meter of how much paper weighs. It's basically its density or thickness. It's not the only standard for how good paper quality is, but if you want to know how thick paper is, which is to say how well does it take ink, um, there's a simple test you can do. Basically, take a thousand pages of any book, 
a thousand pages and measure it next to a nickel. Okay. If it's, if it's about the size of a nickel, a thousand pages, you're working with really light GSM. You're probably talking 27, 28 GSM. That's going to be very, very thin tissue Bible paper. Okay. A lot of quality Bibles use that very thin paper, like my wide margin heirloom crossway. Um, but that's not going to be the thickest and best paper for you. So if a thousand pages is more like the size of a quarter, then that paper is going to really take ink well. Now to the book you asked about, you asked about the Crossway Interleaved Bible, which has a full blank space between every page that has 50 GSM, 50. Okay. So if thin Bible papers, 27, 28, if decent is 32 and really good Bible paper is 36, okay, like a, like a Schuyler Quintel's like 36, this interleaved Bible has 50 GSM paper. So it's as close to real paper as you're going to get in a Bible. But trade-off, there's always trade-offs, right? This thing's a beast. This thing is huge, okay, super heavy, and def definitely can't carry this thing around. Matthew R., what do you mean when you say you don't want to read the manuscript at 1207 in the video? Because though I write out a whole sermon manuscript word for word as though it were an article or an essay, the last thing I want to do is stand in the pulpit and read an essay or an article to the congregation. Um, I have several videos on preaching, Matthew, that may be helpful to you. I think I have a playlist on preaching or it's called pastoral ministry or something like that. But um, basically in some of my preaching videos, I talk about the worst kind of preaching is the person who reads you their manuscript, which is the most boring delivery style. Over against the exact opposite is the person who's making it up as he goes. He <laughs> doesn't have an outline. He doesn't ha have a manuscript. He's just up there talking. Those are the two worst kinds of sermons. And I want to, I want to be in the middle of that. I want a well-organized, very, very um, specific message that I'm preaching from a text, expository, with real applications that I'm making. But I don't want to read it to you like I'm reading a lecture. Okay, I want to deliver it with passion. So in some of my preaching videos, I talk about pathos, ethos, and logos. Those are the, those are the three things that Aristotle talked about in the art of rhetoric. Pathos is your, your passion, your passion, right? So you want to preach with passion. Ethos is your credibility, which is your character, and logos is your content, and all three of those things have to be good. Eric says, what do you think of the Net Bible? Well, I don't have one, but it is awesome. I did look at it. Uh, the Net Bible has a huge ton of manuscript-related notes in it. Um, I'd like to get one. In fact, I was hoping they'd send me one for review, but they didn't. Uh, that's Maybe they just don't know my channel. That's okay. Um, yeah, I might get one. Helpful. Good. The Net translation, though, isn't my favorite. It's a little bit more functional equivalent. Um, I'm more of a formal equivalence guy. I'm not so much a dynamic translation, and the NET is a little bit, a little bit uh, too dynamic for me. Okay, Whitney, we're making progress here. Whitney says, "What sources did you use to see how Edwards outlined the Bible? In other words, how did I, how did I find out what Edwards does with his studies?" Well, thanks for asking, Whitney. It's my favorite topic <laughs> besides scripture. I love Jonathan Edwards. Um, I am a Jonathan Edwards scholar, which means I've devoted much of my academic life to studying Jonathan Edwards. So I did my doctoral dissertation on Edwards, and that made me do a ton of reading in Edwards' primary works and also works about Jonathan Edwards. In fact, my dissertation is, is a published book. You can get it. It's called A Theology of Joy, Eternal Happiness in the, Jonathan Edwards and Eternal Happiness in the Holy Trinity. You can get that book on Amazon. But if you don't want to, that's okay. There's a ton of books that talk about Edwards and what he did. Here's one I want to recommend to you right now. This is the Jonathan Edwards Encyclopedia. I don't know if that's backwards on your screen. Sorry if it is. Jonathan Edwards Encyclopedia. If I had one book about Edwards, I might want to get this one um, because all of the entries are extraordinarily helpful, give you two-page digests of everything about him, his background, his life, his writings, his context, his theology. That's a great book. Also, I contributed four uh, 
essay, four articles, encyclopedia entries, entries is what they are. I did four in this book, so I'm in it. So that's why I like it. However, if you don't want to buy anything, go to edwards.yale.edu and his entire corpus, everything he's ever written is online for free thanks to the Yale online editions. And if you're interested in the miscellanies, there are several different volumes on his miscellanies. And if you're interested in his blank Bible, you can read that as well online. You don't have to buy anything. All right. Uh, Michael, how long did it take you to fill in the Eagle? That's the wide margin Cambridge five years and then it got too full. So, but, but that's heavy usage. We're talking every day. We're talking sermon prep. We're talking dissertation phase of my life. We're talking teaching Bible studies, new members classes, all kinds of courses and lectures. So five years of heavy, heavy usage and you're out of room. Greg, how long does it take to get through the process minus teaching notes for non-preachers? Well, I don't know what you mean by the process. I, I assume you're talking about the, the ex exhaustive Bible study system, but that's a that's an ongoing thing. So, I mean, you're talking catch as catch can. You, you're doing your devotions. You're taking your notes. You're writing miscellanies. It's whatever you want to make it. And the miscellany system can be as long as you want. You can have 10,000 miscellanies if you want to. Um, you could fill in tons of wide margin Bibles if you want to. But let me just answer the question a different way. I tend to spend about an hour in the mornings in my, in my Bible, about an hour every day. Nam says, how do you use Google Keep? Well, I already talked about Google Keep once but I do use it for multiple things. The one thing I do use it for that I mentioned in the video was illustrations. I don't want to fill up my Bible uh, with a ton of personal life illustrations. I would use them, certainly. But I just don't want my Bible filled with that. I'd rather have notes on the text itself filling my Bible. Um, so I use Google Keep for illustrations. And the one reason I like that is so I can keep them alphabetically. Because with a digital file, um, you can put things where they are in alphabetical order, which is much harder to do on any sort of paper system. So digital files are great for alphabetizing things. Paper files are good for numerically referenced things. Nancy R. says, great video. I left the question. Okay. She, say, she says, Basically, how do you know how many pages to leave for your table of contents if you're going to use a miscellaneous notebook? This is easy. So what you do is you calculate the number of pages in the notebook. Divide it in half, divide it in half again, take about a quarter of it, count the pages, multiply times four, that's your total. <laughs> or do it the hard way and just count every page in the notebook. Basically, you need to know how many pages are in your notebook. And then what you're going to do is you're going to devote one line per page, and you're going to calculate that by the pages in the book. So here's an example. Let's say you have a notebook that has 300 pages, okay? Well, assuming I can get 30 lines uh, per page, then I'm just going to divide the total number of pages in the book divided by the number of lines per page, and that's how many pages I need to, uh, to reserve for your table of contents, and everything should work out perfectly, right? There you go. Uh, that's kind of a long question here. Michael P says, uh, it's basically about pencil versus pen. Okay. A lot of words to get to pe pencil versus pen. I do have one Bible that's all pencil. It is a hardback that's exactly like the, the heirloom crossway wide margin. It's got the exact same pagination, exact same layout, only it's in a hardback and it's way cheaper. I use pencil for that one. For some reason, the paper in that one is a little bit different and it takes pencil really well. But I don't like pencil because it tends to rip my paper. Um, I use mechanical pencils and I use a 0.7, not a 0.5, which is should be the thicker one, but it still tears my paper. So if I have thin Bible paper, for whatever reason, pencils tear my paper and I can't stand that. So I have to use pens. I am in the group that uses the Pigma Micron pen. I think it's the best thing going. It's archival quality ink. It'll last forever. It's pretty much smudge free. 
And uh, in my opinion, it's the cat's meow. All right, Linda, did you find it difficult transitioning to the ESV wide margin after using the Cambridge for so many years? Does it bothersome that scriptures are in different places on the page? Yes. Yes, it is bothersome. That is one of the worst parts about switching Bibles. I don't like switching Bibles. I'm a creature of habit. Uh, visual spatial memory is my primary. So, yeah, that was a big problem. Still is an issue. I still have a hard time finding things immediately. Just today I was looking for that passage in First Peter 3 where he compares baptism to Noah I could not find it in my Bible because I knew exactly that it's supposed to be on the right page, right column, middle. I couldn't find it in my, in my new Bible, so it's going to take a while to do that. But I don't want to invest a lot more time in a crossway, I'm sorry, a Cambridge wide margin because the font is getting too small. And I'm thinking long term, as my eyes get older, it's not going to be a good investment for me, whereas the crossway has notably bigger font. John, what do you use now for your everyday carry? I think the pit, uh, Cambridge Pit Minion is too small, right? Just bought your book, by the way. Well, thanks for the book by John. You are the man. Appreciate that. Not sure which one you got, um, but cool. Yeah, I love the Pit Minion, but just don't, just don't carry it right now. Man, I love that Bible. I'm still using my Crossway heirloom wide margin for everything now. That's just my everything, carry around, using it for everything. By the way, several of you asked about my ESV Lion. What happened to it? Still have it. Still like it. Still love it. Um, just using the, the wide margin more. Eric. I was just thinking about how I should go about studying the Bible, especially how to take and keep notes. And you uploaded this video. Great timing. Tend to do most things digitally, but I just started a paper notebook to cultivate more disciplined meditation on biblical topics with an aid of uh -oh, pen. I actually got this idea from Jonathan Edwards. For I heard he was taught this by his father. Uh, thinking with pen in hand that he did so throughout his life. I was actually meant to ask you about this since you study Edwards. So can you tell any details how Edwards did this thinking with a pen in hand? Was he like meditating on a certain biblical topic or was it just simply more, how would I say it, mechanical study like writing or what was it all about? So um, the thing about Edwards is that he wrote all the time. Um, it seems like he never had a thought that he didn't put on paper somewhere. Edwards had a large system of various notebooks, including his blank Bible and including his miscellanies, which are the two most famous. But he also had many, many other notebooks that he kept on all kinds of various topics. So, for instance, he had one notebook called Notes on the Apocalypse, which was just about the book of Revelation. He had another one called um, Notes on Godliness, which is his thoughts on Christian moral living. He had another on Types. It's called Types and Shadows of Divine Things, where he looks for types in the Old Testament and in uh, nature. He had all kinds of, of various notebooks. And you can actually look online and see what his desk looked like. His desk was especially built to house all of his various notebooks. And what Edwards did was genius, was cross-referenced all his notebooks to each other, especially through the miscellanies and through the blank Bible, which is why I constantly refer to them. But Edwards is the kind of person that always thought with his pen in hand. And we even have some anecdotal stories about Edwards where he would, even if he was riding on a horse, he would attempt to write a small note and pin it to his overcoat so that he could remember to take fuller notes later when he got home. So back in those days, everybody was homeschooled, right? Because the public school system was not yet formulated. And, and yes, he did learn this from his father. His father was also a, a ravenous note taker. But it wasn't necessarily exclusive to just Jonathan Edwards. Uh, many of the Puritans, and especially the theologians and pastors, were encouraged uh, to have these kinds of notebooks. And so we see this, for instance, in the Cotton, Cotton Mather and Increase Mather. They both had these kinds of books as well. So it wasn't unique to Edwards, but I would say that he probably took that system further and more extreme 
than most. All right, a couple more questions and then dinner's almost ready. Gina says, a uh, great point that most of us have spent a lot more time on our phones than our Bibles. This Bible has been on my wish list. I'm trying to get my Bible marking perfected. I really like the symbols and have some of my own. I would love to see a close-up of your symbols. Actually, I already do have a close-up of my symbols on my YouTube page. If you go up to my page, um, not the community tab, but there's an about tab, which talks about myself a little bit. If you scroll down on that, I have a couple of documents sourced there that everybody asks me for all the time. And I got so many requests for them, I just ended up posting them publicly. One is for my scripture reading checkoff list. You can, you can uh, print that up from there. And the other is a picture of some of my symbols. Now, I will say that the picture of the symbols... I change it all the time. That's dated to a couple of years ago. So I, my symbol system has probably uh, progressed a little bit since then. But that would be a little starter kit. Basically, I recommend some combination of a capital letter and a little bit of a picture that describes it. So you can invent this kind of a system on your own. But let's say you want a symbol for baptism, right? So what I would do is I would take a capital B and I would draw a little raindrop for water around that B. And that would be a good system for baptism. Uh, but you can make up any system you want. I use a little tulip flower for the reformed doctrines of grace. Um, I use a little rainbow for the covenants of God. Uh, I'm trying to think of a few of them right now. I, I do a little tablets, little, little, you know like a lowercase m for the law of God, but make up your own uh, or use mine. Sarah G., would you create a similar video for people who are new to the Reformed faith? What are some basic resources that you would recommend for me to take a look at? Um, basic resources for the Reformed faith, Bible, Westminster Confession of Faith, um, Some modern sources, R.C. Sproul's What is Reformed Theology is really good. J.I. Packer's Knowing God is really good. Uh, John Frame, Salvation Belongs to the Lord, really good. Start with that. Jacob W., do you have a beard because of Calvin? No, I have a beard because my face needs all the help it can get. <laughs> Michael D., um, thanks, Pastor Matt, for the idea I want to cross-reference my Bible to other theological books. Yes, excellent. That's another kind of note that you can put in your wide margin. Um, you might want to abbreviate the titles of the main books that you read all the time and absolutely put cross-references to them to your Bible and vice versa. All right. Well, thanks for checking in, everybody. We did 37 minutes of questions and answers, so hopefully I answered your question or one similar to it. Thank you so much for checking in. I do love you lots. You're the greatest YouTube subscribers in the whole world. I'm very thankful for you. Even you weirdos that comment weird stuff and uh, put all kinds of crazy notes in my comment section. I love that. You guys make me laugh. Uh, you're truly great. Thank you so much for subscribing. Recommend and share to anybody that this may be helpful to. Hope to see you soon. Uh, let's pray that this COVID-19 thing is over so we can all get back to our churches and meet with our, our people on the Lord's Day and receive the Lord's Supper again sometime soon. Okay, thanks. Love you lots. Talk to you later.